I'm going to just, uh, mine is just all demonstrations here. I'm just showing you a few of the tools. Um, I've worked in accessibility consulting for 12 years, um, pretty much from graduating from university, been in this field. Um, so here are some of the things that I use um, day to day just for achieving common accessibility tasks. Um, one, one piece or one requirement that uh, Cameron mentioned was having color, uh, sorry, having captions for multimedia. So this is a screenshot of a video I did for SSP Bark Group about um, color contrast. And I actually added the captions myself by hand. So options you have here, uh, YouTube now has a free analysis of your video content. If you upload your video into YouTube, even if you keep it private, you can benefit from getting like a first pass of a text translation of your video. So they don't train their text translation to your voice or anything, but it does a pretty good job, at least for starting um, if you hadn't had any transcription. Um, that's one technique you can use freely is to upload your video to YouTube and even keep it private if you're doing it for something internally at an organization. Um, another option that uh, we've recently been using for a lot of multimedia we produce is a company called Amara. Um, they allow you to basically software as a service, upload your video to their service. They have a very fast turnaround, about four to eight business days, and they charge a fee of $2.50 to $3.50 per minute of your video. So if you have some type of content um, in your organization where you need to get it done quickly and at a high quality, um, you know, this is one of the innovations in the accessibility space now of like you have a way to outsource that at a very cost effective approach and um, they do translations into other languages as well so that's part of their uh, you know dual benefits of accessibility lots of people that don't speak English as a first language or if you wanted to have your content available in other languages that's a service that's sort of built into <laughs> using something like this so those are um, two techniques for captioning um, a <clears throat> technique for color contrast analyzing um, so Cameron showed a tool where you basically input color values to find out if they're compliant. Um, a tool that I frequently use is a tool from the Paciello group called the Color Contrast Analyzer. And so this tool is very manual, but the benefit of this tool is that it runs, there's a Mac download and a PC download. And the way this tool works is that you actually can use a color picker to hover over things in a UI and tell if they're um, compliant. So as I mentioned, it's, it's manual, but an example would be on um, Google's homepage, right? Their logo has several different colors um, that are used in the logo. And this is theoretically the model that you use with this tool is that you select a foreground and background color by um, hovering over the UI. And um, selecting different colors. Typically that updates. Um, but you, you basically have a color picker that as you hover on the UI, you'll, what we should be seeing is like a blue um, would be picked up by this color picker. So instead of typing the text value, use a color dropper where you click on the color and you get a value. And so that's what a lot of people need to use, especially when they're testing images of text, because the idea is that similar to the other tool where you could type in these different color values, this tool also lets you select colors, but it updates and tells you if it's compliant for small text or large text. So a lot of people like that because it has a quick visual. You can just click on colors and see if it fails or passes. So, you know, this is horrible, 1.08 to 1 contrast. Very light yellow on a white background, horrible contrast, it fails for everything. Um, but you do get into those cases, like Cameron was mentioning, where if it's between 18 points and 14 points, there's different requirements. And this tool, a benefit of this tool is it does show you if it's compliant for large text versus small text. So it's, it's um, fairly easy to use. and. Similar to Cameron's presentation, all the links to download these tools will be made available um, after the presentation. Um, 
Another tool that I use is the Chris Pederick toolbar, um, again, available for Chrome and Firefox on, and works on both platforms, PC and Mac. Um, this tool can look at images, display alt attributes, the really common accessibility requirement. Does my image have an alt attribute? Um, it has these plugins that let you validate your feeds. One of the WCAG 2 requirements, uh, which makes sense, W3C created web content accessibility guidelines, is that you need to validate with the W3C parser your website. So that's one thing that this tool can do is to actually validate HTML against um, the W3C validator, and it'll tell you um, if the just the DOM itself, the HTML markup you used is compliant. And that's actually a check that I don't find a lot of people run, but again, from thinking about one of the goals of accessibility is to make your content work across every browser, across every system. That's where this idea from the W3C and all these accessibility standards comes about is if you code things correctly via HTML uh, for the web, you should be having stuff work across the different browsers um, as good as possible. And I would second what Cameron said, you know, ideally you start from somewhere, like we um, and a lot of the work I do with organizations, they get overwhelmed by there's so many browsers, so many assistive technologies. You know, the, the reality is most people start with Internet Explorer and JAWS on the PC and VoiceOver and Safari on the Mac. Those are very common test passes. And then NVDA and Firefox um, would be a second test pass that people frequently do on the PC because NVDA is a freely available screen reader. Um, I was going to demonstrate that really quickly. Um, as Cameron mentioned, I use Parallels on my um, Mac, so I can run um, NVDA. Uh, NVDA is a tool built actually completely by two developers who are blind in Australia. Um, the development of this tool has been very harmonious uh, with web standards. So they basically built a screen reader that followed the different specs from the W3C as closely as possible. Um, so rather than work with how applications were built, they more follow the spec. So a lot of times if you're working as a developer on something where you're following the spec from the W3C, NVDA is probably going to work better than almost any other tool for validating that your work um, was done correctly. I am using, um, at the very bottom of the screen, there's this red highlight rectangle. That's a plugin that I recommend you install when you use NVDA because typically when you demonstrate a screen reader to people, they're not able to follow along with what the screen reader is reading, especially if they're not used to seeing a screen reader. So this is a free plugin um, by a developer from Japan. <laughs> where at least visually as I move focus around in the screen, the tool actually highlights visually what's being read. So like even if the synthesized voice, I'm not plugged into the audio system here, it is reading a uh, calculator menu item. When you are demonstrating or training people on where accessibility issues are, I find that if the item is highlighted on the screen, they're able to follow along a lot better. So I always have that plugin installed with NVDA. Um, and another thing just to point out, I'm going to mute the voice. Yes, that's an NVDA plugin. Yeah, and NVDA has a plugin um, library that where you can go and download a bunch of different. They have a plugin that works with like a screen magnifier, so you can have the screen magnified as you focus, which also helps if you're in certain presentation scenarios. Um, you can install that plugin, and it'll highlight. You know, it would zoom in even more closely on where you're presenting. Um, there's a speech viewer. Um, that's also something helpful to turn on in NVDA if you're trying to get people to understand what the screen reader is speaking. The speech viewer writes out exactly what the speech synthesizer is reading. And so that's another tool I recommend turning on if you are training people or demonstrating to people accessibility issues. Being able to see what the screen reader is actually reading is very helpful. So if you're reading a file name from, for an image alt text, you can see the whole horrible um, text that's being read by the screen reader helps you present in more ways than one, like why there's a problem with the website. Um, and lastly, um, 
I wanted to show the tool um, from SSB BART Group, uh, who I frequently uh, do consulting work with. Um, this is a paid tool. But um, from the standpoint of you're working in an organization where you are doing compliance monitoring or accessibility reporting for WCAG 2, CVAA, Section 508, any of the common accessibility legislation requirements, this tool allows you to put the information from a scan of a page or a set of pages into a report. And that's very important for compliance documentation to actually validate that items have been recorded as having issues and then being recorded as being fixed. So this is the Firefox plugin for AMP. And just showing that I ran it on New York Times. I always like to harass New York Times for some reason as my example. But they've got some accessibility issues um, on their site. And one of the examples would be, very commonly, the alt text for images. So different images will be highlighted in the tool. And then you can see. Um, actually off on the side of the page, which is scrolled off to view, we can actually see how to fix an issue, how to test an issue, um, and then how to flag an issue. Um, the other benefit of this tool is testing for web accessibility. For those of you all that have done that in your day-to-day -day job, it can be really complicated when a web page has you know, 5,000 elements inside of the DOM. So this tool, one of the um, workflows is that with Firebug, you could just um, inspect a very certain part of the page um, and then send, wait, not in Firebug. Um, you could send a section of the page into AMP to be tested. So you could say just the um, expand collapse widget on my site, I want to test that for accessibility. I don't want to test the entire page. And that's, um, you know, just from my experience, been a common challenge with a lot of um, automation and accessibility tools is that you get overwhelmed with the noise of a lot of results for your whole page. Um, I think with that, like we had unfortunately like not a ton of time today with our uh, new meeting, so we appreciate everyone coming to the meeting and we'll take a few questions here at the end, um, but then we'll be happy to continue talking and discussing down at um, Beecher's Cheese and just socialize with everyone. Uh, so does anyone have any questions for Cameron or I just on what we've talked about today? The, the question was, uh, are any of these tools better for really intense data, data applications? And, I, and it, I'm going to try to uh, communicate what, what I think you mean by intense data applications, like things that are um, really content heavy and a lot of interaction, a lot of tables, for balance. Um, well, I mean, Thomas, you might be able to speak more specifically to a lot of content. Um, I can say from uh, from like a very JavaScript heavy application, um, accessibility developer, developer tools is nice because it focuses on ARIA. And ARIA is a standard for enhancing um, markup native semantics for accessibility. So you can put uh, an attribute on a tag that says ARIA hidden and it will instruct a screen reader, for example, to not announce that content. It's a very simple example, but um, accessibility developer tools really kind of focuses on ARIA, so it's a good, it's a good use case for that. Um, do you want to speak to data-driven or like yeah. heavy data applications? Yeah, I would just comment for data-driven scenarios. I mean, you do need to either have an automated development script sort of set up that's testing and stepping through a data-driven app, and then sending via Tenon or SSB's AMP or a software-as-a-service model where you can send a snapshot of the DOM to be tested as you iterate through each step. That's the typical workflow to automate that, is you do need to have some familiarity with writing test automation mm -hmm. and then sending it to a validation tool. That or like something like what I'm demonstrating on the page with Firebug, you click, you show the data table on the page, you send that data table in to be tested, you click something else to expand a form or put some errors on the page, then you send that. And so that would be the manual way of doing a data-driven 
thing. And that's, again, part of the process of like testing a page with this tool. You type a name that's unique at for each DOM snapshot. And that's important for your report later so that you can say, yeah, I expanded, you know, data table one. So yeah, I, I'm always on the test automation side if you can build that into your workflow. John. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, like, what is the response that I've gotten from other developers when, I, when using Capybara Accessible specifically? Uh, so you, you hinted at something was, which is uh, using it in Jenkins. It's a CI tool. So really, uh, your team has to be comfortable with the idea of automated testing. Um, TDD is great. Test-driven development is a is a flavor of programming style. Um, so if you have a team that's, that's comfortable using continuous integration and TDD, uh, it's, a, it's a nice segue. I mean, that, that sets the stage. Uh, if you have a, a team that doesn't write tests, that doesn't use continuous integration, um, it's going to be a harder sell because there's a lot more infrastructure set up to even run the tests. Uh, to answer your question specifically, um, to be honest, it's been mixed at times. So uh, when working with other developers, the tooling has to be really light touch, meaning if you get a lot of false positives, people are going to tune it out. They're just going to stop paying attention or they're going to turn it off. Um, and this is especially important when you're talking about something in continuous integration. If, if, I, if I deploy some code or if I push some code, and the build fails because of a false positive in the accessibility suite, people are going to lose confidence and they're going to be kind of annoyed. So um, I think the answer is trying to uh, focus on tests that are, you have a lot of confidence in. Um, so color contrast would be one, labeling elements, alt attributes, things that you know that you can uh, fail on with high confidence and err on that, that end of the spectrum. Um, also provide mechanisms to uh, effectively blacklist certain tests. So being able to say, oh, we know this test is failing, we know it's inaccessible, and we're going we're gonna to come back to it, but right now flag it and say, like, be quiet, um, then we'll go a long way to building your team's confidence and, and like, goodwill. Do you have anything? Yeah, on, only thing? extra comment. Like, I, philosophically, I always try to get organizations just to do one test at a time because of exactly what Cameron said. I'd much rather see, like, all the alt attributes get fixed mm -hmm. on a site versus that you have 3,000 violations. And, oh, great, I have 3,000 violations. I'll send that into my compliance officer, which, unfortunately, is what the bad side of automation has been for accessibility, I think, for many years. So I would just basically echo what Cameron said. You want your best tests. And I think the less you do that are really consistently working well and you show that those are working well, then you can add in more. But that would be you know, a way to start showing, like, hey, we're making progress on accessibility and the tools actually work. Uh, well, I think um, we should uh, get ready to start packing up because the library closes right at 7 on the dot here. Um, but we, again, appreciate the New York Public Library and Jill and Chansey for allowing us to do the meetup here this week. Um, we are planning for February to host um, a meetup at the same time from 7 to 9 p.m. as our usual time slot. So stay tuned to the website for an update about our next meetup. Again, uh, thank you for our sponsor, SSP Bark Group. For those of you all that are um, interested in coming down to eat, um, they'll be sponsoring some of the food at uh, Beechers. So thank you. Thanks.